Now that we have a sense of how phylogenies are made, let's take a look at some examples of what they're used for. First practical use of a phylogenetic tree, this comes from the textbook. It's known that there are essentially two major strains of HIV in humans, HIV-1 and HIV-2. And HIV-1 is virulent and is the major cause of the AIDS epidemic. HIV-2 is less virulent. It's less of a public health risk. The disease does not kill and spread as rapidly as HIV-1 does. So a question that we might want to ask is, did HIV-1 and 2 diverge after humans contracted HIV from simians, from primate SIV, SIV is simian immunodeficiency virus. There's a common ancestor here, HIV, and then HIV-1 is the virulent one, HIV-2 is there. Or do these strains represent two distinct infection events that were separate? So did we pick up HIV-1 from one type of simian immunodeficiency virus? Did we pick up HIV-2 from a different simian immunodeficiency virus? And this is interesting because, or it's useful, if it's the first one, then it doesn't matter what simian immunodeficiency virus we study in primates because we know that there's a single transmission right there. But if it's this history, then we are better served studying whatever this simian immunodeficiency virus is over here instead of this one because this is the more dangerous HIV. This is the SIV that would give us better information that's more useful for saving people's lives. So it turns out that when, when we went back and made the phylogeny, this is actually the phylogeny that we get. That in fact, it looks like HIV-1 and HIV-2 are the result of two separate infections from primates. And HIV-1, the virulent one, is more closely related to the SIV that we see in chimps. HIV-2 is more closely related to the SIV that we see in Sudi mangabees. So that tells us that if we're going to study SIV to help us understand HIV, we are better off studying the SIV that chimps get than the ones that Sudi mangabees get. If it was this tree, it wouldn't matter, right? We could study either one and they'd be equally informative. But with this tree, we know that we can optimize our research by targeting this particular SIV. So phylogenies can be used for more than just how are things related. They can be used to allow us to make predictions about what we should do in the future. Here's a second use of a phylogenetic tree. So these are wolves. So this is not the ancestor of modern dogs, right? Wolves have been evolving just like domesticated dogs. But the ancestor of wolves and dogs probably looked a lot like wolves. And from that ancestor, we've artificially evolved like bulldogs here. And this is the Save the People in the Mountains dog. People like this dog for some weird reason. These are hunting dogs. They hunt weasels. This is fireman dogs. And these are little um, amusement dogs or whatever, right? So it might be interesting to know, like, how are all these different breeds of dogs related to each other? So here's a paper from just a few years ago. What these authors did is they went and they got 85 different breeds of dogs from 400 individuals. They looked at things called microsatellites, which are DNA-based markers, and then they made a phylogeny. And so you can see here our phylogeny. We have all the domesticated dogs, bootstrap number of 100, indicating that in 100% of their trees, all the domesticated dogs are the result of a single evolutionary lineage. Right? So dogs were domesticated once, and then wolf is the outgroup. And then we see a few other things. We see Sharpei, Shiba Unu, Chao Chao, and Akita as kind of their own separate group here. Uh, Basenji off on its own. Maybe you've never heard of a Basenji. They're these dogs here. They, have, they only go into estrus once a year instead of twice. They yodel instead of barking. You see Husky and Malamute. There's a very high bootstrap number here. They're sister taxa. They're very closely related. Not entirely surprised because they look very similar. Same thing for Afghan Hound and Saluki. But maybe it's a little surprising that Huskies and Malamutes aren't like Basil, right? That these breeds came off first and then this breed. And then there's this separation here for these guys that still actually look a lot like wolves. These we know to be old breeds because uh, Salukis are actually there are drawings of them on Egyptian pyramids. They're in the Quran as the, the kind of dog you're allowed to have if you want to have a pet dog. So we kind of knew from historical records that these were ancient breeds. And then it turns out all the other breeds that we're familiar with are kind of in a big group down here. So there's something really interesting and special about these ones. These were the first breeds that were kind of isolated and given their own evolutionary trajectories. All the other breeds are kind of mashed together 
in a very flat phylogeny like this. So at one point in domesticated animal breeding, we suddenly kind of invented a whole bunch of different breeds of dogs. So the previous slide was just this part of the tree. These are all the other dogs that we're familiar with, all the result of very recent selective breeding. This is just within the past few hundred years. So I have this dog. I have this dog, Starbuck, and Starbuck is an Australian Shepherd. This is her Christmas present. <laughs> she likes to sleep, and she has this really interesting thing where she has two different color eyes, which is actually not unusual for her breed. She's what's called an Australian Shepherd. Turns out that Australian Shepherds are almost like a mystery breed, right? So if you go to the Wikipedia page, um, the very first thing it says, the Australian Shepherd's history is vague, as is reason for its misleading name. These guys did not come from Australia. And in fact, nobody really has a good idea about where this breed came from. It just kind of showed up in the American West about 150 years ago. But when they made the phylogeny, the authors included Australian Shepherds. So now we can actually look and see of information about this, this best breed of dog. So go in our phylogeny. Uh, these are, this is Starbuck as a puppy. She was cute even back then. If we go into our phylogeny here, we actually see Australian Shepherd is sister taxa with Border Collie. So that's these guys here. Here's an Australian Shepherd. Here's a Border Collie. They actually look very similar. Our border Collies have erect ears. Australian Shepherds have floppy ears. But much of the rest of them is the same. They're both very intelligent breeds. They're both very high energy breeds. Not entirely surprised that Australian Shepherds are related to Border Collies. What's maybe a bit more of a surprise is the next closest relative is this thing here, which basically doesn't even have any eyes. Well, it has eyes, but they're under the fur. We would not perhaps not have expected this to be the most likely next closest relative of these two breeds. Maybe we would have expected a lab or a German Shepherd or something a bit more athletic <laughs> and, and non-comical um, than this thing here. So we can use these phylogenies to answer all sorts of really interesting questions, like where did this mystery dog breed come from? What's it related to? And then in retrospect, you can see uh, it does make a little bit of sense. This is another herding dog, right? These actually herd things. That's the function of these dogs as well. So phylogenies can be used to answer all sorts of interesting questions. Some of the other sorts of questions that the text talks about is we can use phylogenetics to determine when humans started wearing clothing, how did chameleons get from Africa to India, and answer questions like when aphid populations diverge, do their symbiotic bacteria diverge as well? And there's all sorts of other things. We should think about phylogenetics as a tool that we can use to answer all sorts of questions. So for example, tracking disease transmission and outbreaks, if you can put together the phylogeny of different strains of a disease, you can figure out where the disease came from. Maybe you can identify some of the people who were the initial transmitters. And there's actually been a court case where a dentist was convicted of giving his patients HIV because when they made the phylogeny of his patients HIV, they were all essentially monophyletic and they matched up with the HIV he had and not with other HIV from other people living in the city. We can do other things like identify hybridization events when two different groups start mating with each other or invasive species. So a species that maybe lives in one part of the world, but its phylogeny indicates that it evolved in a completely different part of the world. And there's no end to the other sorts of questions, right? So using a phylogeny to understand the history of taxa allows you to answer any question about the history of those taxa. And in that the present is determined by the past, um, using these sorts of techniques allow us to learn a lot about the present.